Welcome to Plato's Pods Online Plato Dialogues. Today is February 28th. This episode is audio recording of a live meetup. We meet through Toronto Philosophy Meetup, Calgary Philosophy Meetup, Online Rebels. I am Eva Ellis coordinating this live discussion podcast. And as you can hear, my cats are even so excited to join us today. And I'm excited to pass the screen to James Myers now. James? Well, thank you, Eva, and, and thank you, everyone, for joining us this morning. And uh, as always, very excited to talk about Plato and uh, especially about the Mino, which I, I've said a number of times in the past was the first Plato dialogue that I read. It's a relatively short one, so maybe easier to approach from that perspective, but it's got so many interesting concepts in it. And, you know, I think I've read it about a half a dozen times now. And every time I read it, I discover new things in it. And, and especially so after having spent our last two meetings talking about the Timaeus. And, you know, I am seeing connections in the Mino to the Timaeus. And I hadn't seen these connections before. And I think it's very interesting. So very much looking forward to exploring that. As I was saying just before we, we officially launched this morning's session, I was feeling a little bit mathematical this morning. And so was led to put an image of pi behind me uh, in my uh, Zoom background, but it was really meant to, I think, draw on that image of the maze that I put in the meetup notice. And the maze was a reference to Daedalus, who was mentioned at the end of the Mino, and Plato talks about the statues of Daedalus. And Daedalus was the one who had the maze uh, with the minotaur in the middle of the maze. And so it struck me that the maze is really kind of an analogy or a metaphor knowledge, which is really, I think, the, you know, one of the main subjects of the Mino. What is knowledge? Knowledge has many paths and we need to find our way through these paths. And uh, that, that analogy, the maze, I thought was, was interesting. And then I kind of see pi as a mathematical maybe representation of a maze something that really never ends and just continues to keep going around with so many different paths to follow. So, so anyway, very excited to, to talk about amino and the nature of knowledge. I think it's something that's, you know, perhaps very relevant to today's time, particularly as we, you know, increase the power of our knowledge with our technology. And in that sense, I wanted to just announce the, I think the next meetup will do uh, Plato's Carmides. Carmides, uh, you know, talks about science and talks about technology uh, in a sense. And I think that that would be a good point to, to pick up on from having done the Timaeus in our last two sessions, uh, talking about the Mino today, uh, about the nature of knowledge, and then to kind of explore the application of knowledge to science and to technology in the Carmides. And I think afterwards, after we do the Carmides uh, in two weeks, uh, we'll do Critias, which uh, is kind of, I don't know, call it the sister dialogue to the Timaeus. It's, it's the continuation of the Timaeus. And in uh, Critias, uh, Plato talks more about Atlantis, which was a technological civilization. So I think we'll do it in, in that order. So next we'll do Carmides and then uh, the Critias. So to launch our dialogue today, and there's no real set order, and, and I actually have to, to apologize. I intended to uh, upload some notes and questions to the shared drive that's uh, linked to the meetup notice, but I just simply ran out of time. It's been a very hectic uh, past two weeks, and so I just simply didn't have time to, to do that. So I think what I'll do today is really just kind of focus on asking a number of questions and uh, participants can, you know, share your ideas on these questions. So, you know, as with Plato, there's, there's more questions than there are answers, which I think frustrates some with Plato, but others find that that's actually kind of refreshing because I think together we can find some answers that uh, maybe individually we didn't know ourselves. And actually we see an example of this very early in Mino when Mino says, oh, yes, it's easy. I can define the nature of virtue. And he gives a, an easy definition. It's in the first, you know, two pages of the dialogue. And then we find out that Mino's definition is fraught with problems. So I wanted to start off maybe by just putting the question, what is virtue? And, and this, this kind of, you know, plays on the question that, that is asked right in the first line of the Mino. Can virtue be taught? So if, if virtue can be taught, we would need to know what it is that we're teaching. 
That would seem to be logical, correct? And so I'm wondering, what is virtue? And in that word is, I'm thinking of what we learned in the Timaeus about the meaning of is. If you remember when we talked in the, uh, the Timaeus, in particular about Stephanus reference 28a, in that logical flow that we reviewed last time, there was that distinction that Plato made between two, two types of existence. There is that existence which always is and never becomes. And that type was comprehended by a reasoned account, which we'll return to at the end of, of uh, our discussion today on the Mino. So that which is and never becomes and is comprehended by a reasoned account. So that's one type of existence that we learned about it at 28 in, in the Timaeus. And the other type is that which becomes but never is. And that's comprehended by the unreasoning sense perception. And so I wanted to put this first question today, what is virtue? But just let's think about that word is, if we could, and, and does it mean that virtue is always, for all time, one thing? And I just wondered what people thought, you know, either with reference to specific words in the dialogue of the Mino or in your own perception of virtue. And maybe we could just talk about the, the four cardinal virtues, you know, which Plato defined in the Republic, in Book 4 of the Republic, uh, 426 to 435. So maybe, does anybody want to start us off on, on, on that foot? You know, what is virtue? Is virtue anything? And we'll use the, the raise hands, if, if you would, uh, and I'll try to call, you know, as always, I'll try to call on people in order. Uh, and again, give some preference to those who haven't spoken before. So we'll start with JK and then Joel and Wayne and Jane. JK? Yeah, maybe just to jump ahead a little bit. Uh, can you say that the virtue is uh, anything that is, or something that is good? And then you ask, what is good? Is that, uh, would good be something that is, that always is? Or can it also also be something that changes? Or maybe it could be built, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's kind of a, for me, that's kind of a general uh, way of trying to capture the idea of what the virtue might be. Mm -hmm. like it could be inclusive of all the particulars, you know, that you might use to, to try to define it. I, I like that. It's a good point. You're, so you're saying that it could be something that's good and good always is and is becoming. So it, it really comprehends both states of, of existence, if I understand your point. Um, I like that. And, and certainly, you know, uh, there is much discussion about the nature of good uh, in the Mino and through Plato's other dialogues. So um, that's a good point. Let, let's explore that. And uh, Joel. Yes, please. Uh, uh, I'm just looking it up very quickly on uh, the Oxford Philosophy Dictionary, and uh, it's just one sentence, is uh, uh, virtue is a trait of character uh, that is to be admired, one rendering its possessor better, either morally or intellectually, or in the conduct of special affairs. So is, is virtue as essentially just uh, a characteristic, uh, characteristic trait uh, to be admired or strived after? Good point. That's that's one particular definition. Does it encompass all definitions of virtue? And so I just I would point people to uh, what Mino says at seventy one e. So this is right near the beginning of the dialogue. Mino, when asked what is virtue, he says it is not hard to tell you, Socrates. First, if you want the virtue of a man, it is easy to say that a man's virtue consists of being able to manage public affairs and in so doing to benefit his friends and harm his enemies and to be careful that no harm comes to himself. If you want me, uh, if you want the virtue of a woman, however, which is somehow different, it is not difficult to describe. She must manage the home well, preserve its possessions, and be submissive to her husband. So that was a particular definition of virtue at a particular time, which we would now say is completely sexist. And Socrates actually does say it's it's sexist and, and dismisses very quickly dismisses that, but there's so in, in that particular definition, there's, there, there's differences of meaning. Uh, Wayne. Well, I'll just give you my, my uh, perception. Uh, I consider virtue as the, uh, intersect, the, the, in, the intersection 
of the of uh, uh, knowledge and wisdom, the rational intersection of knowledge and wisdom. Mm -hmm. It's that point which you find virtue. Intersection of knowledge and wisdom. I like that. That's a that that's an interesting thought, Wayne. Thank you. Any other thoughts, Jane? Greg? Jane first. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so this is how I understood the logic based on rereading the dialogue and on what we've read previously, uh, specifically the Timaeus. Um, uh, I'd like to probably start out with um, drawing on that there's being the eternal, which is what created the world that is becoming, so the changing. And as I understood it based on the Timaeus, um, the good knowledge, virtue, wisdom, those are all things that are from the eternal, from the world of being, I guess it could be called. And the thing is that the human world, as, as I, I think that Plato and Socrates saw it, is the world of becoming, the changing. <clears throat> Excuse me. So technically, we can't ever grasp the being. And to us, it seems like someone just uh, mentioned that the good can be changing. And as, as I understand what Socrates is trying to say is that when we think the, the, the good or like virtue or knowledge or wisdom, it's changing. It's actually not because it is, it always is, it is eternal. But since we are viewing it from our world that is always changing, it appears to us that it is changing. That is what makes us think that it is changing when actually it is something that is eternal. I think that's why uh, closer to the end of the dialogue, um, Socrates came to the conclusion that, well, at least I, I, I saw it as Socrates trying to say that you can't, you can't actually grasp knowledge of virtue, but you can have a, like a good right opinion of it. And I think this is sort of like a hint at that a concept of like eternal versus uh, always changing. That's 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 all I wanted to add, thank you. Thank you, Jane, and, and for picking up on, I think it was JK's point at the beginning that, uh, you know, the good is maybe something that always is. Uh, but I guess, you know, maybe the question is, how do we perceive good? Is, is my perception of good the same as your perception of good or is anybody else's perception of good uh and you know in fact i'm, I'm thinking of the Move. i'm thinking of the um that uh, uh point of logic in the timaeus where uh it was described why the why the creator created the universe and the, it said that the creator was had no jealousy and was good and so it was out of goodness that the universe was created so that's an interesting point um i just wanted to Raising. Sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. Can I just jump in to like yeah. comment a little bit just yeah. really quickly? Um, I think that like, again, the, the, the reason that why we see it all, like each person has a different conception of what is good and what is bad. And those conceptions can um, interfere with each other when people start communicating or when, when there's a situation of conflict. And as, as I understand it, that we all have slightly erroneous um, conceptions of things just because uh, we don't have that understanding of good that is based on oh gosh that is based on the concept of being this okay <laughs> I, I should probably think this out more but yeah so there's there's this general sorry um this is I'm having uh okay yeah I'm gonna have to think about it and formulate it better because yeah but yeah, sorry, I can't. I can't put it in words now. I'm really sorry. No worries at all. I, I think uh, you're, you're touching on. I think maybe what you're touching on is that point in Tim Timaeus 28a, uh, where it says that to comprehend that which is, and if we if we think that the good it always is and never becomes, but always is, to comprehend that which always is, we need a reason to count. And so I think what you were trying to do. And what the rest of us try to do with the good is to try to make a reason to count. Um, you know, if we think that the good is eternal, we need to make a reason to count to kind of account for what is good. Um, and is there anything that tells us what's good? No. I mean, Plato in 28a of the Timaeus says you need to make a reason to count. You won't, 
you won't find it written in stone anywhere. So I think uh, maybe maybe that's an example of that. So no, thank you very much for that point. We'll go to Greg and then uh, Asso. Greg. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm sort of continue on what Jen just commented. Jen made some very good comments. I think uh, in relation to what you already said as being and becoming. And uh, my feeling is uh, like many of the the concepts in you know those platonic dialogues that you know. It's not that Plato or Socrates already know the answer, and particularly in the virtue, it's, a, it's attempting to to really to explore the possibility of answer. And I think there's a two practical angle here. Like you said, that uh, one is to look for the eternal eternality of a, of a concept such as being, as a, I mean, concept as a being that's eternal. Therefore, uh, it is uh, uh, can be considered as a knowledge. And another thing is uh, another angle is really to look at this practicality. As as uh, you know, James and other people point out that uh, there's all kinds of uh, thinking uh, opinions about what a virtue is. So practically, it will be good to put a definition onto virtue, and so that everybody can agree on. Even though everybody can have a different opinion, but nevertheless, to agree on a, on a common virtue, so that it's practically can be used. So one practical angle, one a kind of a theoretic angle. So I think uh, in that in that sense that they are very much looking for kind of um, explore, you know, the, the possibility of, of knowledge. And uh, and here, you know, there's also this counter argument in the in the 70, um, 72. And I think Amino was saying that uh, there is a virtue for every action and for every age, for every a task of hours and every one of hours. And uh, in, that, in, that, in that sense that, in a way, the counter argument is very clearly stated out in the sense that why are they, you know, the, the difficulty of, of defining virtue, basically. Mm. Well, thank you. And uh, I think you make an interesting point, Greg, about the practicality of it. Um, and, you know, certainly at one point, Socrates, you know, at the beginning of the dialogue, he asks, what is virtue? And, and Mino starts giving examples of different types of virtue. And then Socrates is, says at one point, well, if you do anything with a part of your virtue, if you, you take a particular action, you know, say we say that courage is one of the virtues. It's, you know, in the Republic, it's said to be one of the four virtues. So say if you take an action with courage, which is one of the virtues, does that mean that your action is virtuous itself or you've just used one particular virtue in committing that action? And so maybe that's a, a question of the practicality of it. If you practice virtue, does that mean if you practice one type of virtue that your action is virtuous? You know, practically so is that the case? It's a it's a, an interesting question. So thank you for raising it. Um, Asso? Asso, welcome. Hi, uh, thanks for bringing me in. So I'm just going to give my response on uh, virtue. And before we go on, uh, I'd like to first ask the question. And I'm asking, why is it that we follow virtue and not vices, perhaps? Or why is it that we want to find truth and not falsehood? I call this the prejudices of philosophers, that even philosophers have to be at some point biased, because truly, there is nothing here to compel us to, tr to truth but ourselves. And so I think that Socrates, when he's writing it, he's trying to, uh, when he's trying to appeal to virtues, trying to appeal to the philosopher's prejudice rather than the human's prejudice. And I'm going to make a distinction in that the philosopher's prejudice is that he must be biased towards reason, in which that he must value reason and enlightenment compared to the human prejudice, which is, you know, being biased into emotion and to their own desires of the lower human being, oh, which is compared to the higher human being, which Socrates probably wanted. So to be able to differentiate in his writings between the higher human being and the lower human being, I am going to assume that he made the writings obscure for this reason, so that only the higher human being was able to interpret, it, interpret these writings. And in that sense, uh, virtue should be practiced as a sense of uh, philosophical expression of such virtue. And it, 
it's in leading of the philosophical life can we truly understand the universe around us uh while the lower man is going to see the universe as you uh, as physical the philosophical man might see it as expressions of ideas just as how a mathematician might see that a square is a formula a philosophical man might see it as a philosoph- philosophical expression of an idea perhaps it's hedonism or it's nihilism but but it goes on and i wanted to say that i think socrates knew this and before he wanted to privatize knowledge and to prevent any corruption of this knowledge and to prevent any uh lower man interpretations so in that sense uh we have to give uh this type of knowledge to the right people and to the right uh beings otherwise we might face uh destruction in our very virtue and divinity of life yeah that's my response thank you for listening well, th- thank you for raising that as well and and it's uh you know certainly you know it's it's an interesting question you know this distinction between the philosophical human and the human who hasn't necessarily been touched by philosophy and so we you know we're all sort of naturally driven perhaps to do what we think is good for us individually but then it becomes maybe a question of is that always good for us individually like if i were to do something that is good for me but hurts you um is my hurting you going to have consequences that are negative to me in the future and i think maybe there is an interesting connection to time in that you know in you know when you talked about the you know the bias of of doing good and of doing virtue you know it's 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 maybe naturally a bias to do something that provides immediate good to oneself but then we have to think about the consequences of time and i'm seeing very much the consequences of time in this whole discussion about the the nature of virtue is that uh something needs to be um in fact if you look at 89d um A9D this Socrates makes the statement we should not only think it right at the time but also now and in the future so he's talking about past present and future we should not only think it right at the time in the past but also now in the present and in the future and i think that's a, an important point to keep in mind and something that relates i think very much to uh, to what you just said so thank you very much Uh, we'll go to JK and then Joel and Greg. JK? Yeah, it seems like if you define virtue in terms of uh pure reason um uh, and you uh, and you uh, are consistent, you know, with that reasoning, with your reasoning about virtue, then you come up uh, against, you know, maybe the uh uh the the what would how would you apply it in real life? you know in the world of becoming or in our existential world of of uh change and becoming so if it doesn't you know if it's consistent with your reason but it's not cons- uh, but it's not consistent with your uh, uh the world of uh, the real world of becoming then how could it be a complete uh definition of what um virtue is it's sort of like the uh, gudo's um theorem right um uh, gudo's theory of um if you uh you have a, co- a complete system it's not going to be consistent mm-hmm. if you have a consistent uh system it's not going to be complete so does that apply i don't know so so it seems like uh the definition of virtue would be would would it would be uh difficult to define rationally mm-hmm. yeah interesting yeah. well the, the word rational you know i think the uh, uh the ancient greeks might have said immensurable and then there are parts of the universe that are incommensurable which is you know we would say irrational mathematically now and so you know again you've raised the the question of practicality um and you know this this idea of 
comprehending that which is with a reasoned account, uh, and that maybe in, in the words that you use can be a rational account, a reasoned account. Uh, and again, that's what Plato says that in Timaeus 28a, that's one of the state of, states of existence, that which always is and never becomes uh, has to be comprehended by a reasoned account. And here we see in, I think it's 98, uh, in the Mino, 98a, I believe it is. Um, yeah, 98a, um, where he says, for true opinions, as long as they remain are a fine thing and all they do is good, but they are not willing to remain long and they escape from a man's mind so that they are not worth much until one ties them down by an account of the reasons why. I'll return to that particular phrase, which just uh, continues to resonate with me. Uh, we'll return to it closer to the end, but I, I just wanted to I just wanted to raise that uh, now. So uh, we'll go to Joel and then Greg. Joel? So for fun, I would like, um, um, I'm playing with the idea in my head of the very question of what what is virtue, so to speak. And I want to challenge whether or not if if trying to, is there in fact a universal definition by which everyone can agree upon what it can consistently be? Because a lot of times, I feel like the question in itself could be a loaded question because if you ask anybody, you, you're going to get similar answers, but you're not going to consistently get the same thing over and over again. It's like it's like asking someone what is what is virtue is similar to asking like what is intelligence, and you're going to, of course, say somebody who's very very skilled in physics is saying that's that person is credibly intelligent. But then, of course, you can ask the average person what is emotional intelligence, and they can pick up on social cues just by talking with somebody in sales, for example, or somebody who's good at dancing and but like is horrible at math. You're going to see an unlimited diversity of intelligence, and it's not just one thing. So, is is there like is there like a universal consistent definition of virtue? Oh, because I find it to be a, a constantly a moving targ a target or a slippery a, a very slippery word that's hard to pin down exactly you know mm. no I mean very very good question if if there were a universal definition I would imagine that virtue is something that always is and never becomes right to go back again to time as twenty eight eight that would be that state of existence if there was a universal definition it would be fixed for all time from past the present to future, there would be no change in the meaning of, of virtue. We would all agree on the same definition. And so, in fact, you you use the word agree, and I just wanted to refer to Mino 79D. So in 79D, um, Socrates makes the proposition that shape is that which alone of existing things always follows color. The, the proposition kind of comes out of nowhere. I mean, they, they were talking about shape, but he makes this proposition that shape, which alone of existing things, in other words, universally, shape always follows color. He makes that statement. He doesn't attempt to defend it. He makes the statement. And then, and then he says, when I was answering you about shape, we rejected the kind of answer that tried to answer in terms still being the subject of inquiry and not yet agreed upon. And so you were ask, asking Joel, is there any agreed upon definition of virtue? Um, I think I think when Mino tried to give a definition of virtue at uh, 71e, uh, he was very quickly like, and Mino thought that that was a universal definition of virtue: man must defend community, woman must be subject to husband. And very quickly, within a few paragraphs, Socrates had deflated that definition. So what? Mino thought had been universal was in fact only a definition that may have applied at a particular point in time in a particular society. But it's, it's a point that I think we need to explore. So thank you very much for raising that. I think that's a very, it's a good way of raising it. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to Greg and then Wayne. Greg? Um, yes, I, I just would like to add on to, I mean, uh, the question just uh, uh, raised by Asio earlier regarding the why, why a society uh, should, uh, should aspire to virtue and choose such a thing instead of the opposite. And it's a really a value question. I think, uh, I, I, you know, think about this probably two level. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking one is really the survival level. Uh, the philosophers are 
ordinary citizens, and their highest value at the time was the poly, the, the city. Everything is good for the city, therefore it's virtuous. So, so these uh, character of virtues are really uh, required for a good city, a good citizen. Therefore, uh, in that way, it's defined. But that thing has changed over time, and nowadays, uh, uh, the characters of a virtue is, is, if you if you could ask, is going, going to be quite different from from the the time of Plato's. And the second is more probably being philosopher. They are they are more more kind of who are looking for the essence and for for the for the things that's called being eternal eternality. And I think uh, in that case. They're probably thinking in you know, virtue is something that, that can be beauty. So beauty, I think, is very high in the, in the value chain of, 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 of philosophers. So something virtuous is beautiful. Therefore, uh, that's more eternal kind of value for them. So I think, you know, and, and the, 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 the thing that there uh, comes to the question that, okay, is virtue as uh, universal, as eternal, as beautiful, as uh, the thing called uh, truth and knowledge. And I, I think they are looking for that. But uh, nowadays we know that virtue really is more sort of a societal kind of character and not comparable to, to the concept of truth. Truth is still higher. Truth and beauty are, are equal in a sense. So I think uh, uh, it's interesting that they, you know, I, I think Asil's question really uh, has, has a lot of hidden uh, implications there. Anyway, that's my comment. Thank you, and, and uh, I, th I think your use of the word beauty is very um, relevant here and very important in, in terms of what Plato writes in this dialogue, but also other dialogues where he treats specifically the word beauty and our sense of beauty and, and this, this concept of beauty, and we'll maybe talk about, well, I know we'll talk about it in, in, in the context of other dialogues, you know, I, I think, but I'm getting this idea that beauty is is something that is eternal, something that is not ever subject to destruction, something that is no. um, that is you know it, it, there's a sense of unity in beauty, you know, and and uh, uh, you know, Greg, uh, you've spoken about the fact that you're a scientist, and and I think a lot of scientists are driven to inquire into knowledge in in. To, to derive new um, new knowledge, to recollect knowledge, if I would use that term, or introduce that term in terms of amino, by a sense of beauty. You know, we think that it's beauty that thing, we think that it's beautiful that things unify. We don't like disorder, we like order. And in fact, in fact, in Mino, Plato talks about order. Uh, and in, in Timaeus, he talks about order and order being more beautiful than disorder. Um, so let's explore this idea of beauty, and, and uh, thank you very much for, for raising that. Uh, we'll go to Wayne. Wayne? Okay, I'm going to try to take this slow and not get tongue-tied. So back to my basic definition is that the rational intersection of knowledge and wisdom is where virtue is found. Within that intersection, a decision is made for the good for it to be virtuous or evil, which is non-virtuous. So within that decision, the preferred action that benefits the object would be the good action. And within that, the subject and the object, the subject should make that decision without regard to the subject. So good or bad or good or evil is not what the subject is going to experience, it's what the object is going to experience. So within that, once you found a, an action or a decision, it's good for the object, at that intersection of knowledge and wisdom, those should result in uh, virtue. So I'll open that up to uh, criticism because I'm sure I missed something somewhere. So thank you. Thank you, Wayne. I, I think that's, uh, I was drawing a little diagram as you were talking there. I, 
I drew two lines intersecting at 90 degrees and I labeled one of them knowledge and I labeled the other one wisdom. And I put a dot in the middle called virtue. Um, and, you know, there seems to be some logic in, in that. Um, and I'm wondering, though, what's the difference between knowledge and wisdom? Uh, is wisdom maybe something that directs knowledge? Um, Are you and, asking me? Yeah, and, and maybe others as well. And, and so that would be one question. And I, I do like the, the suggestion of uh, the difference between subject and object. And I'm, I'm thinking that maybe what you were talking about was outcomes in terms of outcomes objective outcomes and so i thought that was that was good so maybe wayne if you could just uh knowledge and wisdom okay. yeah knowledge and wisdom the difference I've, between that there's uh, there's uh light years between them knowledge is, is uh, to me are the truths the thing that you determine to be uh the, the, i guess for lack of a better word truths that covers a wide category but wisdom you can have a lot of knowledge and have no wisdom. You have no, so wisdom is the ability to apply those truths and to, to in, a, in a reasonable and rational fashion. So wisdom is the use of knowledge, whereas knowledge is just facts and truths and things, and you put them together, mm -hmm. and you have to be able to put them together in some type of, of order or, or a logical process, and that's the wisdom. That's been that's something that when I retired a couple of years ago, I decided to study this in depth. In depth and I found it to, to be very uh, useful to me. I, I actually use this in, in everyday practice. But I can have lots of knowledge of things, but if I don't know how to use them, uh, the facts and truths are worthless to me or, or to anybody else for that matter. So that's my definition. But I would love to hear what other people say because I could be totally wrong. Well, Wayne, th thank you very much. I mean, I think that's really, uh, you know, I, I, I'm getting, I'm getting kind of a almost a computer science connection there. You know, if I think of the topology of knowledge and wisdom, you know, combined, you know, in some sort of direction for an appropriate outcome for the object, you know, knowledge to me is kind of like in, in the computer science concept, it would be like the data, and wisdom is what the programmer would apply to make the data do certain things, if I'm understanding kind of that analogy of what you were saying, the application yes. of, of the knowledge. And so it, it's not just that we have data, but it's that we know what to do with the data, you know, and, and this is why I think this, this dialogue is so relevant to the tremendous power that we are now developing with, and, and with computing science. And this is, this is why I mentioned this, you know, I follow a lot of the, the developments in quantum computing in particular, Tremendous power, tremendous power. But the question is, can we use that with wisdom? And I think you've really touched on it, Wayne, that, that uh, uh, you know, this, this idea of what do we do with knowledge? You know, and, and so I, I think the amino is so important to that, to understanding that. So uh, let's see what others have to say uh, about what Wayne just said or any of the other topics that we've touched on so far. I do want to go uh, into more, a little bit of the Timaeus connection uh, in our next segment, but we'll, we still have time. So we'll go with uh, JK and Greg and Joel. JK? Yeah, I think uh, what Wayne was just saying about the knowledge and wisdom is interesting. So I don't know if it, this applies, uh, referring to what uh, Kierkegaard said, talking about, uh, you know, I think talking about his predecessor of. Uh, uh, building a castle and living in a shed or something like that. I mean, you know, I mean, is it, you know, one is, uh, has a, not, a lot of knowledge about how to construct a, a gigantic, uh, tremendous castle, but he, but he lives in a, <laughs> lives in a shed um, next to it. And also referring to the, um, the idea of beauty and and truth and order and so forth, you know, um, the idea of uh, <clears throat> the beauty as a kind of a unification of of, uh, of understanding or something, and um, that is that does does not depend on disorder, you know. I mean, order. You know, in order to have order, you have you you have to 
you know, bring a bring a unity out of out of something that is disordered, right? So it seems like you know, chaos is also important, you know, in a universe, in a cosmos, you know, that is that is complete uh, 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 order orderly. So maybe someone said that uh, <clears throat> we don't live in a cosmos; we live in a chaosmos. Um, so I don't know if there's any truth to that. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you, J.K. That was um, actually, you know, when you when you talk about bringing disorder into order, it makes me think of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, um, you know, which I think Greg and some of the other scientists here would understand. You know, this fact that we live in a universe that is physically uncertain, uh, two standard deviations orbiting around the same point, uh, all focused on the the Planck constant, which is the universal minimum. And so, and, and I think that's, it's a good thing that we live in a universe that is uncertain because it means it's not static, right? Who would want to live in a static universe where all of the outcomes are predictable? Um, and so the fact that we don't live in a static universe, we live in a dynamic universe means that we actually have agency in this universe. We, we can cause things to happen um, and we can establish our own uh, direction, you know, if if I were to use that um, analogy of programming, you know, as I was ex um, responding to Wayne a minute or two ago, uh, you know, as the programmers, we are not constrained in in the program that we apply. If the universe were static, we would be constrained, but we're not constrained. So, what we have to operate with is knowledge and and wisdom. Perhaps, if I'm to build on what Wayne was saying, you know, maybe is wisdom. Um, you know, what helps us to bring order from disorder or chaos, if you want to call disorder chaos, is, is wisdom uh, which helps that. And so um, let, let's explore that idea. So we have uh, Greg, Joel, Wayne, and then Jose. Um, yes, uh, I'd like to uh, expand uh, what uh, Wayne has uh, kind of uh, his notion about recent uh, knowledge. I think, uh, you know, um, I'd agree that wisdom to me is the ability to apply knowledge to a particular situation. That's an a, 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 a important aspect of wisdom. But I would also think that, you know, knowledge in relation to wisdom is a, wisdom as a, as take as a system, knowledge is one element. You have, so when, 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 when you apply wisdom, we include holistically that the entirety of what you know, what you value, but what is needed at the situation. So, so in a way that while knowledge is generally about something, uh, was it true or not, and what it is, but wisdom is really matching that knowledge to the specific situa situation and come to kind of perspective context and the relevance. And, a beside, uh, uh, and then bring that to understanding on the one hand, uh, you know, understanding that in the context of perspective of what that, that knowledge is and that situation is. So you're really matching the situation to knowledge and then in the context of value and the perspective and the problem issue needs. So only with a consideration of that, uh, you, you, come, uh, you come to a, a proper, a good decision. So that's why uh, the wisdom to me often is connected to the maturity. That's why you don't see wisdom in kids. You see a lot of wisdom in older people because they have a lot of experience. So knowledge experience uh, combined with the situation, you come to better assessment, understanding and application. Mm -hmm. So it really is a holistic perspective. Interesting, interesting ideas, Greg, and certainly, um, you know, this idea of context, I think, is very important, you know, and, and each of us is a unique being, each of us has our own unique life's uh, experiences, and so for each of us, the context of any particular situation is different. I mean, the context of my sitting here, speaking to everybody at this, this time, what's led me here, the account of the reasons why I'm here, is different from the account of the reasons why you're here. And I think it's in making this account of the reasons why we're all here. I mean, that, that to me is the context that we'll talk about sort of towards the end of this. I wanted to raise a point, though, because you talked about maturity. 
And there's a point that uh, Plato makes at 89b in the Mino. He says, if the good were so by nature, in other words, if, if people were just simply born good, we would have people who knew which among the young were by nature good. We would take those whom they had pointed out and guard them in the Acropolis, sealing them up there much more carefully than gold so that no one could corrupt them. And when they reach maturity, they would be useful to their cities. Isn't this an interesting statement, given mm -hmm. what goes on in the Republic? Um, you know, it, it was a couple um, episodes ago that we talked about the Alcibiades and points were being made that Plato was some sort of totalitarian uh, because of the way in the Republic, there's this creation of the guardian class and children are taken away from their parents and sealed away and trained to be perfect because there's some perception that they're born perfect. Um, but I think what you just explained, Greg, is this, that this process of maturity is required. And I think, um, I think, you know, Plato is very much on that line. And so, you know, in, in, when we get around to talking about the Republic, um, I think there's something that's maybe misunderstood there. I don't think Plato's necessarily advocating for that. I, I think this is this point that he makes at 89b, uh, in the Mino, I think is, is very important. Um, so we've got, uh, we've got Joel and Wayne and Jose and Jane. Joel? Okay, yes. That, so this is a very fun question. Um, the differences between intelligence and wisdom. So I want to give very quickly two or no, three. We're not talking about intelligence and wisdom. Oh, no, sorry? I'm sorry. I'm, I wasn't muted. I apologize. Okay. All right. So, sorry, go ahead, Joel. Yeah, is, uh, okay, well, I just want to make sure I'm correct before I go off on this. Is, 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 that, is that a fair question? Are we uh, figuring out the differences between intelligence and wisdom? Yeah, I, I think that's, that's kind of where the discussion is heading. Certainly, I think it's fair to address. Okay, well, I, I want to give t uh, t uh, two very quick examples. So um, when I was working out West uh, in different fields in the trades, uh, I remember my boss telling me that we were hiring a guy who like went to some of the best schools in mechanical engineering and has a really high GPA and as you know, he's just a brainiac and he's going to basically like, you know, take over the field and everybody's going to have to step up their game. So when I was, uh, uh, when I was paired with this guy, when he was hired on, I realized very quickly that he was book smart, but like, he didn't even know how to like, uh, put together a caulking gun. Like he, he knew like the textbook definition of how, like what things were and how tools work. But when I told him or asked him to fix something or something went wrong or think on his feet, he was just, it, I, I was shocked. It was like, it was almost like he, he was starting from scratch, if you will. So um, another example is like my girlfriend, who's a midwife, she, you know, you, you obviously have to go through three or four years of intense uh, academic procedures through university, but there's a huge difference between being book smart and thinking on your feet in an emergency situation, right? It's like, how do you apply that information? So you can be intelligent and know what definitions are and know it off by heart, but being able to use it and adapt and evolve through that and see a bigger picture, that, that's an entirely another skill altogether. So I'm going to say that's where like wisdom could essentially come in. And then of course, very quickly, my favorite part on the Big Bang Theory is when Sheldon's like taking a road trip with all of his friends at nighttime and the car breaks down on the side of the road and Sheldon's like, well, there's something wrong with the car. Does anybody know anything about internal uh, combustion? And everybody just laughs like, yeah, of course, we all have like PhDs. We're masters about this kind of stuff, right? Like this is what we went to school for. We're rocket scientists. And then Sheldon's asks, well, does anybody know how to fix a car engine? No, not a clue, <laughs> right? Like, I don't know how that works. So there's, I like to think that's a good distinction. <laughs> interesting, interesting points. And it, it um, you know, it does, it, it's maybe a, a good lead in to the, um, to the slave scene or the, the scene with Mino's attendant um, where Socrates makes the point that all knowledge is recollection. And the question is, we can be taught specific pieces of knowledge, but only if there's agreement on the nature of that knowledge. So maybe there's agreement on how to fix a car, uh, and maybe that is something that can be taught. But for those things which can't be taught, maybe recollection is the important thing. And so maybe the first person 
to figure out how to fix a car, you know, there was no textbook or manual for that. And so, you know, maybe recollection at that point is really important. And so I think that's a, uh, uh, an interesting point to, uh, to consider, certainly in terms of the practical applications that you talked about. Uh, we have Jose and then Jane. Welcome, Jose. Hi, James. Hi, how are you, everybody? Hi, good. I, thanks. Thanks for being here. <laughs> I, I just wanted to share something that I read uh, some time ago about definition of philosophy, and maybe it has something to do with who we're talking. Uh, he said that uh, philosophy is, a, is a basically three branches. Epistemology, that is look, looking for the truth. Ethics, that is looking for the good and aesthetic, aesthetic that is looking for the beauty. And he said that the, that the truth is good and is, is beautiful. What is beautiful is truth and is good. And it, what is good is truth and beauty. So there is a, a, a kind of an interest. It's a, it's a very nice uh, thought that I wanted to share with you. Well, thank you. The truth, ethics, and aesthetic, I like that. Uh, <laughs> It really does seem to combine everything that you know. Maybe we all kind of seek in our lives, and so uh, an interesting point to uh, to raise. Thank you for that for that uh, perspective and for that definition, um, Jane. Um, okay, I'm probably going to be backtracking a little bit um, because we've kind of already discussed these things. But anyways, um, regarding wisdom, I was uh, to me wisdom is not only the ability to apply. But wisdom is when you are able to understand the implications or the consequences of the knowledge that you are applying. And an example that I could think of is in agriculture, um, uh, when we started to implement different substances to improve crop growth or, or, or whatever, this, uh, in, in some of the cases, applying the substances without having the right amount of knowledge, of true knowledge brought to, for example, soil being ruined. And so like it, we ended up doing in the long run harm to ourselves, even though we thought we were doing something good. And this was mentioned, I think, very early on in the dialogue that um, why would we want to pursue virtue? And if judging by what Socrates said, uh, as I understand that any person who is truly knowledgeable in a sense, would never want to pursue vice, or would would never want to um, would never want to ignore virtue because virtue is what makes life good. So if you're not living a virtuous life, it's never going to be good. And it, unless you wish yourself evil, you would not pursue anything but virtue. This is what I understood from what Socrates was saying. So basically, a lot of the things that we're doing that uh, that are not virtuous are because not because we wish evil or we don't want to pursue virtue, but just because we don't understand what virtue is. So basically, if we were able to answer the question right now in dialogue, we'd be able to uh, live the perfect life, I guess. But anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of trailing off. Another thing I wanted to touch upon is the concept of chaos and order, uh, because some of the things that I've come across and thought about is that ultimate order is is not a good thing. So I would imagine that ultimate order would lead to, to a sort of um, state of static, to a state of stagnation. And if we're talking about total order in terms of, for example, uh, political, uh, the political, this would mean a sort of dictatorship. Um, and from what I understand that chaos, even though if it's, if it's total chaos, it has a negative element to it. But at the same time, um, Chaos is what adds dynamic. It's what adds a sort of, I would even say a sort of creative aspect to life. And then this sort of leads me to a question regarding what is beauty? Because especially in the modern world, we're really, um, the concept of beauty is being expanded to things that, well, for example, I personally wouldn't consider beautiful, but they're, they're being projected as something beautiful. And in a way, I think that in our world of becoming, the concept of beauty is based on a balance between order and chaos. At least that's one of the ways that I've thought about it in the past. Well, um, 
you really hit on so many themes there, Jane, and I think it really summarizes quite well what we've discussed to this point. Um, and so let me let me say a few things about that. And then what I wanted to do next was, uh, Eva, if you would get the, the triangle slide ready. I wanted to go to that because I, I think there's some interesting points that we can explore there that we'll, we'll talk about. But what you said, Jane, you know, wisdom being the implications, I've seen that connection to what Wayne was saying in terms of uh, understanding the outcomes. And I'm also seeing a connection to time because it's, it's, you know, what we do with data right now in the present, we have to think about how it's going to play out over time. And, you know, so, you know, the example of doing something that affects the climate, uh, you know, we are now, you know, COVID has caused us to, um, to think about the implications longer term of what we have done to the client and young children like Greta Thunberg, um, you know, have caused us, have, have given us pause to say, hey, listen, you know, 50 years down the road, I will be alive, you won't. What are you doing to the world that, what implications are you causing to the world of the future that I will have to live in that you're not, you know, older people? And so I think that's a very important thing. And again, that connection to time in this dialogue, that wisdom, wisdom is maybe something that helps to guide us through time. Um, you talked about order and, and this, you know, uh, order leading to a static state and, you know, very much, I think, connecting to what I said about Heisenberg's uncertainty principle and how that uncertainty is actually a good thing for us, but only if we use perhaps wisdom uh, to, to, uh, to approach uncertainty and use a sense of, of you know, knowledge and, and understand the difference between truth and untruth in knowledge. And again, so much particularly as we have this tremendous computing power uh, about to about to revolutionize life with a quantum computer. So I think that's so very important that we, we use that power with wisdom uh, and understand the implications because it will happen so quickly. Um, you know, you use the term perfect life, Jane. You know, if, if any of us could be born to lead the perfect life, well, that would be kind of a static state, right? Then, then, then there'd be no room for creativity, would there? Um, I don't know. And so maybe that's the beauty of life is that there is this creativity and, and, you know, a scientist like Albert Einstein, for example, uh, came up first with special relativity in, in 1905 and then general relativity in 1915. But he didn't stop there. He didn't, he didn't become a static scientist and stop seeking and learning. And, and throughout this dialogue, the Mino Socrates says, you must continue to seek and learn. And that Socrates says is re recollection. Uh, you must continue to seek and learn. And so Einstein continued to to seek and, and learn through the rest of his life. He he never was comfortable with the idea of, of quantum mechanics being separate from the the larger mechanics of general relativity. And he was seeking that beautiful perhaps connection. Maybe, maybe he saw this as some sort of beauty that drove him through the rest of his career to seek this. He he never found it. But he was led to to seek that, and uh, and so I think again that connection to seeking and learning uh, that that Socrates keeps making the point that we never should stop to seek and to learn because every time we do we discover more, and and so we have that chance to be creative and not static, and really the chance to set our own program uh, through life. If we want to take it back to the computer science analogy, it's. You know, we are the programmers. We are not programmed. We are the programmers. And so I think that's, as we enter this, this quantum era uh, of the power of quantum computing, I think it's something worth, uh, very worth remembering. Um, so I wanted to, Abby, if you put up the, the slide, I wanted to take us back to Timaeus uh, in this, because this is very present in the Mino. This, so this concept of same and different. Um, in, in the discussion of uh, virtues, um, Mino, in, in the Mino, keeps coming up with examples of virtues, and each of the examples is different. Uh, you know, virtue is being good, virtue is having power over others, virtue is beauty. You know, he gives so many different examples of virtues, and uh, Socrates says, um, we have found many virtues while, while looking for one, but we cannot find the one which covers all the others. That is at 74a. So Socrates says that. So we have found many virtues while looking for one, but we cannot find 
the one which covers all the others. And then in, in 72b, uh, Socrates has just finished saying, you know, we've, you know, Mino, you've given me a swarm of virtues. And he says to, to play on the word swarm, uh, why don't we talk about bees for that matter? So he starts talking about bees at 72b. He says, bees are the same in one respect, but differ in others. So again, this idea of same and different, which is very much in, in the Timaeus. Bees are the same in one respect, but differ in others. And he gives examples of how they differ. They differ in size, they differ in beauty. Uh, and then he says the same of the virtues. Even if, they, even if the virtues are many and various, in other words, different, all of them have one and the same form, which makes them virtues. So one and the same, but different, right? And so I wanted to just recall, and we left off um, two weeks ago, our last episode in the Timaeus talking about um, this idea that Socrates puts, or, or that, that, that uh, sorry, that Timaeus puts forward, uh, that the universe is composed of triangles. And, uh, and then we, we looked at this diagram that I have on the screen uh, at the end of our last episode. And we, we were talking about that, that section. There's a beautiful section in the Timaeus where um, Timaeus is talking about the creator and the difficulty that the creator had mixing the same and the different and bonding them together. And, you know, as I keep thinking of that scene, I'm thinking of, you know, when you go into a store and you order a can of paint and, and they mix the different colors together. And then they put the can in that shaker and the shaker shakes and shakes and makes a lot of noise. And I had this kind of image of the creator putting the same and the different in this big universal can and shaking the whole thing together and the difficulty of making them stick together. Um, so I think this is what, what uh, Plato was trying to say in, in the Timaeus, this, this concept of the same and the different, but bonding them together. So we've got, we've got the, the virtues here in the Mino, that Mino is talking about all sorts of different types of virtues. But Socrates is saying, well, don't tell me about all the differences. Tell me about how they're all the same. Even though they're different, how are they the same? And so I wanted to return to this, this diagram that we looked at because it, it talked about the triangles and uh, Timaeus. And again, so for our listeners who, who don't see the screen in front of me, it, it's a simple triangle on the screen. Uh, it's a 45 degree, uh, the angles uh, at the edges are 45 degrees. Uh, it's a right angle triangle uh, pointing to the right. There's a right angle tri triangle pointing to the left and they're joined together. So the base of the triangle uh, I've lab labeled B. Um, so it's a horizontal base. And then there's a vertical line A that bisects the base. So divides the base in two. Uh, so there's A on the vertical, B to the left horizontally and B to the right horizontally on the base. And then there's the hypotenuse on the left and on the right, and, and those are labeled C. And we know from the Pythagorean theorem that A squared plus B squared equals C squared. And that's ancient knowledge. I mean, I, I think most, most uh, what do they teach that now in public school, I think. I mean, most public school, I, I think hopefully pretty much everybody here uh, has heard of the Pythagorean theorem and, you know, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So I'll just go back to the question that I asked two weeks ago in our last session and ask where you see in this diagram of the triangle with the, with the, uh, with the vertical line labeled A dividing the base uh, labeled B on each side and the hypotenuse labeled C, where do you see same and different in this diagram is, is does anybody want to take a stab at it so this idea of mixing same and different and you can just refer to them by letter is is uh, uh, a same and b different is c same and b different or is a combination of things any thoughts on that i think we had some answers last time on this is a the same as b is C the same as A or C the same as B? I don't think anything is same as each other. Or is nothing the same? Thank you. We have all sorts of choices, but Pythagoras would say, what would Pythagoras say? I mean, Plato was after all a geometer, right? So Plato understood Pythagoras. 
right? That no one who is bereft of geometry enter these doors was the, the sign above his academy. So in a right angled triangle, A is the same as B, right? And A squared plus B squared equals C squared. So C would be different from A, different from B, right? So this idea of same and different. So if we think of C as different from A or from B, but A is the same as B, then if we were thinking of virtue, like if we have all these different virtues that Mino is talking about, if we were thinking of different virtues, well, if C is different, would we put the different virtues on the line labeled C, the hypotenuse of the right angle triangle here? And where would we where would we put all virtue? All virtue, regardless of the differences between them, where would where would all where would the where would the nature of all virtue converge here, Joel? This may be very off base, but I see virtue everywhere. Right. I th I think that asking for a specific spot for virtue may be misleading, and mm -hmm. that. The red dot, which could be infinitely divisible or placed anywhere on the perimeter of A, B, or C, mm -hmm. could all be virtuous depending on what plane the triangle was being viewed in, what mm -hmm. dimension. Mm -hmm. You're seeing virtue everywhere. Yeah. But how about, how about one virtue? So when, when Socrates says at 74a, we have found many virtues while well, looking for one, but we cannot find the one which covers all the others. So is there one which covers all the others here? Um, Greg? Um, you know, it's interesting you use the triangle to kind of uh, um, make an analogical kind of a comparison to virtual. And you ask that whether A, B, C are the same or different. I would say they are the same and they are the different. I think the same thing goes to, to virtual. So I think uh, Plato, I mean, like uh, I was trying to having Socrates look up for the sameness with a different kind of virtue. So we think like A, B, C, e, we, we tend to look at the, them as a different because they have a different lens. But if you, if you look and say, well, they are lines in that first lane. Okay, right away, they are the same they are, because they are made of lines. They are lines. No, they're just of a different length. Right. Yeah. And then also you can say, well, they are part of a triangle. Therefore, again, these lines are part, not just lines, but they are the lines of a triangle, mm -hmm. further defined, just okay. different lengths. Okay. So B and B may be different because they, they are the two lines, the different the triangle. They, even though they have the same lengths, but nevertheless, they are different. So in okay. the sense that I think uh, um, this triangle actually quite, uh, quite interesting in terms of symbolize the, the way that the difficulty to really look for sameness and difference in different type of virtue. And uh, I would say that they may have some similarity in the sense that you may be able to get out some sameness from different virtues, but also look for differences between the different virtues. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. It's, uh, and, and certainly you make the point that uh, the, the lines are going in different directions. So that makes them different. Uh, but in a right angle triangle, A would equal B. So in this case, if we, if we give a length of one to A, uh, then B has to be one as well. And the Pythagorean theorem would tell us that C is what? C is the square root of two, right? Now, the interesting thing about that, uh, to go back to what we were saying earlier about uh, what's rational and what's... Uh, commensurable is that with a with a length of one, A would be uh, commensurable with B, which also has a length of one. Uh, but C is incommensurable. So C is C is mathematically irrational. The square root of two is irrational. And the proof of that is by reductio ad absurdum. Um, so it's it's interesting here, not only do we have uh, things that are like A is like B, but different from, from C, we have rational and irrational or mathematically commensurable and incommensurable as the Greeks uh, would have put it. So um, I just wanted to, I wanted to recall this because we're gonna go 
into a discussion of that slave scene where Plato actually places the the squares with the with the Mino slave. But you can make a square out of this. How do you make a square out of this? If anybody wants to answer that one, I'd be I'd be happy to entertain that uh, question, Jane. Um, I just um, I wanted to um, say that in the context of the Timaeus dialogue, I understood the same as being so. The same is basically a synonym for the eternal or for that which is being, and the other is a, a synonym for the changing, the becoming. And as I understand it, the changing, the becoming is what is sense, opinion, and belief. So something that, that is opposite of intelligence, truth, and reason, if, if we were going with that dichotomy. So when I think about it in those terms, um, it's, it's, it's really hard for me to comprehend this um, diagram of a triangle, to be honest. I can't I can feel that there's a way of applying it, but I just, I can't make it out for now. Uh, but to answer the question of how to turn it into a square, I think if we were to take the um, the two triangles that make up this triangle and flip them over to fill up the uh, left top corner and right top corner, yeah. I would that would make a, a square, right, I think? Yeah, yeah. I, I think you're, you, you hit the nail on the head, Jane, thank you. So it, you, would, you would just kind of reflect one triangle over the other and you'd have a square. Yes, you're yeah. just sort of like flipping it over like diag like on those, on the yeah. hypotenuse, you just flip it over. Yeah. yeah. And you get a square. Exactly. So we'll see as we, as we go into that, uh, that scene where um, uh, Socrates sort of asks questions of Mino's attendant, uh, we'll see triangles in it. We won't see them at the beginning, but we'll see them at the end. Uh, and that's, I think, helpful to demonstrate. You know, I, I think there's a particular logic here that uh, that Plato is uh, is exploring, and the logic is based on triangles, uh, and it's based on this idea. I think also that uh, this particular right angle triangle here is both rational and irrational. It's rational at A and B, and it's irrational at C. And and I'm speaking mathematically there. Um, so, and, and if you want to use the, the words of ancient Greece, it's, it's commensurable and incommensurable both at the same time. Last time, um, we ended with the question, uh, where do we see the soul in this? Because certainly in the Timaeus at the beginning of it, um, you know, the Plato was talking about the formation of the universe and the embedding of the soul in the universe. And so I just wondered if anybody is seeing where the soul might be present in this particular diagram of the triangle. Jane, oh, Jane, did you did you want to uh, add to that? I yes, I did. I'm yeah. so sorry, I forgot to unmute. Yeah. Um, you, you just mentioned that A and B is rational. Uh, so based on based on how I understood the terms of the same and the other, since A and B are rational, I would say that they are the same. And if C mm -hmm. is irrational, then it is the other. Mm -hmm. um, since the rational and irrational are joined by essence to create a whole. I would assume that the essence, I don't know, the, the essence would be the joining points and the whole would be the triangle as a figure, I guess. From what I understood previously, the soul is when we join the rational and irrational. So in, in this diagram, I guess the soul would be the triangle as a whole figure, I guess, if that makes any sense. Well, I, I think you're you're certainly you're certainly using what I would call a reasoned account. Uh, I think you know you've you've demonstrated, Jane, that you know by applying reason, you know that that you've determined or, or at least put forth a, a proposition as to where the soul might be. Um, J.K., what are your thoughts? Yeah. <clears throat> So you're saying that the uh, uh, the geometry and mathematics represents can represent both uh, being and becoming, the rational and the irrational, and so the perfect, so the eternal soul would be a, um, a inclusive of or represents it, the soul is is that which is uh, both rational and, and irrational. And these are perfect geometric forms that these 
and the perfect carrier geometric forms of uh, that lady was referring to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, are the eternal forms of, and is represented by these geometric shapes in mathematics. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, certainly to bring it back to this question of the universe of uncertainty, which again, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle established is that, that physics operates according to that principle of uncertainty. The one thing about geometry is it's certain. And so maybe there is some actual connection there in terms of, of uh, where the soul might be, because we don't, want, we don't want the soul to be here today and gone tomorrow. I mean, we have to be pretty certain that we, you know, the soul is capable of operating at all times. And so, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, there is this connection between the, that the soul has to encompass does it not, uh, both that which is rational and irrational, or commensurable and incommensurable? I, I put that as a question. I, I don't know uh, the answer, but uh, Greg, what are your thoughts? You know, it, it is interesting that uh, to look at this triangle and then to think about the rationality, irrational or, or, or rational. Uh, put in the historical context, that uh, the the reason that uh, you know uh, C is considered irrational is there are some triangles that you just can by resolve the uh, solve the equation you don't get a rational number a whole number, and at the time at the time of Pythagoras it was ho it was horrible. How can this number exist? Therefore, they consider this irrational. But uh, as time passes by, we no longer consider C as irrational because we consider it rational because there's a good good reason mathematically and, and, and you know, conceptually to explain why C is rational. So it's a, it's a commensable. So, so in a sense that uh, when, when at the Plato's time, uh, it is still considered a irrational and you can use this to kind of uh, account uh, for, the, for, the, for the soul that is combination of rational, irrational as symbolized the thing. But uh, historically, I think, uh, uh, you know, it seems that uh, we are going gradually on um, what is uh, uh, kind of uncommensable to, uh, to commensable from irrational to, to rational. And it seems that the, the direction is one way. You know, something become rational, never becomes irrational. And then things that you, was used to be considered as irrational now become rational. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a historical perspective on these things. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and, you know, actually, as you, as you talked about, uh, uh, you know, irrational versus rational, you know, and, and things moving towards rational, maybe that's an example of, of this, this kind of order that, uh, that Plato talks about is, uh, you know, we, we want to move from a state of disorder to order. And in fact, in the Timaeus, he says, order is always better than disorder. And so is there any order in the irrational hypotenuse of this triangle? C, the square root of two, is there any particular order in the square root of two? The square root of two, if you put this as a continuing fraction, it goes on forever. One plus one over two plus one over two plus one over two continues on forever as a fraction. Is there any particular order in that? Can you say that something that goes on forever has a particular order? Um, Can I jump in here for, yeah. for a quick okay. comment? Yeah. Please. Yeah. I think uh, you know uh, it, it's interesting uh, the historical perspective that that they started this tradition. But uh, you look at the history of science; it really starting from a world of uh, total disorder, very little understood to to today. We almost understand everything. So in a way that we sort of come to, uh, I mean, the, the 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 mental world of seeing the disorder of the the reality. Gradually become more, the reality might become more and more ordered. Today, the world is almost ordered, even though there's still a lot of things that we do not understand. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it does the uh, uh, rationality, irrationality, and uh, order and disorder, they're all connected. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the world is ordered if you, if you, if you look at thinking in, 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 in a extreme metaphysical sense. Mm -hmm. And that's why that when, when Heraclitus, when he first, first conceived, uh, or this insight that logos, uh, the world has logos, and essentially saying that the world has order. And from that point, that people start to, you know, the, the Greek people start to looking for knowledge, uh, truth, and, and, 
and then come to the concept of science, and we think uh, uh, are using it uh, to this point. So I think uh, you know this movement from disorder to order is very much the uh, a, a, I think the, the history of of, of science. Mm -hmm. No, and 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 I think the point that you make is is a very important one, you know, and it relates again to time, you know, that over time science moves from disorder to order, and I think that's maybe just demonstrates our kind of natural tendency to want to find order in these things, and so you know, over time, Pythagoras was the first one to display this or, or to demonstrate this this relationship this proportion it's it's a proportion and and in in uh, in Timaeus you know one of the things that Plato says is that everything is proportion so we have this particular proportion here a squared plus b squared equals c squared and and that that has informed some great things over over time including you know Einstein's theory of relativity, which wouldn't have been possible without this knowledge that Pythagoras um, gave to us, uh, you know, many thousands of years ago. And so, maybe we'll just, uh, Eva, if you would maybe just unshare the screen at the moment. We'll just return to a, uh, a full screen, and um, maybe just have a, a brief discussion, you know, about this. You know the where knowledge is, and, and I want to. I don't want to forget that question though of where the soul is. I want to go back to to that question. We're, we're going to find the soul in that triangle image. We will find the soul. Um, I would just ask maybe one question in that respect. What if you were to rotate the triangle? But the at at uh, eighty e in the Mino. Uh, Socrates re remarks that Mino's argument uh, is that a man cannot search for what he for what he knows, since he knows it. There's no need to search for it, nor for what he does not know, for he does not know what to look for. And then at 81D, he says, "As the whole of nature is akin," and I'd like to kind of understand what that sent, what that that particular phrase means. As the whole of nature is akin, and the soul has learned everything. Nothing prevents a man after recalling one thing only, a process men call learning, discovering everything else for himself. If he is brave and does not tire of the search, for searching and learning are, as a whole, recollection. So, you know, Greg, maybe what you just said about science and this process of, you know, learning over time and applying one piece of learning to generate another piece of learning which then goes forth and generates more and more learning, you know, is there, is there any boundary or time limit or end to either the soul or to learning? Or are neither of those things bound by any sort of limit? Uh, and, and certainly Plato talks about uh, boundary uh, at 75e, uh, he talks about a boundary or a limit. Uh, so is either knowledge or the soul subject to a boundary or a limit, or do they go on forever? And I'm just wondering what people think about this. And I want to I, I use this discussion you know, in about, we have about a half an hour remaining, um, to get into that scene where, where uh, Socrates brings Mino's attendant out and asks some questions. And in asking the questions, the attendant who has no schooling demonstrates knowledge. So maybe we'll just start, you know, is there any boundary to what we can learn? And is there any boundary to the soul? And when, when Socrates says this particular statement, I, you know, I, I, want to throw it, I want to throw it out there to the participants. Do you think, as Socrates says, that nothing prevents a man after recalling one thing only, uh, a process that men call learning, from discovering everything else for himself, if he is brave, brave and does not tire of the search. What do you think of that? Do you think that's logical, correct? Anybody have any thoughts on that? Greg? I'll give it a try. Uh, I think, uh, you know, again, come back, so, like so many things that, all these questions started from Plato and uh, Socrates. I mean, these are very early time. They were really trying to differentiate what we call today is what the difference between intelligence and knowledge. Really, uh, uh, intelligence really 
the, the, the innate ability to, to get to knowledge. And well, that knowledge itself is really the result of the process of intelligent uh, process. And uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, um, at that time, uh, they, 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 they were trying to figure out the nature of these things. And we now know better that, that uh, you know, knowledge is one thing, intelligence is another. And, uh, and also this learning, and you, you could say that the, if you get, can come back, say, say a child is born, and without going to school, just leave it alone, he will come to certain knowledge about himself, just about pure intelligence that the human has. So there is a recollection process, not a recollection process, there's an innate process of intelligence. If you, if you will say intelligence is the kind of uh, recollection of, of nature that to, to awaken your innate ability to learn, then there is a recollection. But as a result of uh, the intelligence process, that's something you can either acquire by yourself can be taught. So both are valid in some way. You know, you, you can have a recollection or, or, or awakening of your intelligence, that's by nature, but also that uh, you can be taught by the outside information and, and by learning. That's also part of intelligence. So, but, but at the time, I don't think that, that you have that good understanding as we, we, we do now, but that's how I, I kind of uh, uh, think of it. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. <clears throat> And certainly, you know, the, the use of intelligence, I think it, it you know, and I'll, I'll put the question out there. I mean, the way I'm understanding it is, is the soul is what uses intelligence. I mean, the physical body benefits from intelligence, but the physical body, like my arm has no understanding of the knowledge that it sees on the screen, right? I'm holding my arm out and I can see my arm on the screen. The arm is not there's the, there's no effect there's a lot of intelligence on the screen a lot of intelligent people on the screen but my arm has no uh, is not affected by the intelligence what what's affected by the intelligence i think is my soul and and i wonder what people think about that you know is is knowledge something that's relevant only to the soul and and is is knowledge what what informs the soul um and i wanted to um yeah, you know, I'll just maybe leave the question there and and, and uh, put it to J.K. J.K., your thoughts? Yeah, this idea of recollection kind of reminds me of, um, you know, this kind of uh, maybe idea of the collective unconscious that we come into the world with a lot of the maybe instinctual knowledge that we inherit, you know, from our from our ancestry and um, and that, but we still have to learn. And why do we spend, you know, um, 20 odd years going to school, you know, so forth, uh, in order to uh, just to dredge up all that, that knowledge that we've already, you know, we've already inherited. Now it's a, it's also new things and so forth. Um, but uh, so it, it's a, it's a, you know, so how would you define the soul in, in that sense? Is that, is the soul the, the kind of, uh, you know, uh, inherited knowledge that we have that is collective that uh, we share with everybody else uh, and maybe that's the potential knowledge that we that we um, <clears throat> that we come into the world with but we still have to acquire so much more in order to in order to stay in tune with uh, with the culture that we're born into mm -hmm. the world that we're born into yeah, yeah it's, it's certainly I mean the the thought that knowledge is something that transmits through time and accretes through time, you know, it is something that's built on through time. It's something that um, we transmit between each other, but we don't, it's not something that's physically transmitted. I mean, we can use physical means to transmit knowledge. We can use cameras and screens and books and words to transmit knowledge, but really what we're transmitting is something that's not physical. And so I'll use maybe what's become a loaded word now, but I'll, I'll use the word metaphysical. And whenever I use the word metaphysical, I just simply mean something that's not physical, something that's not physical. And, and metaphysical to me is the invisible universe uh, that Plato talks about so many times. And we talked about in Timaeus, this distinction between the visible and the invisible. He talks about it in the Phaedo. Um, 
you know, so so knowledge is part of the invisible universe, I think, maybe, whereas our bodies are part of the visible universe. But somehow the visible and the invisible need to connect. And certainly the soul is invisible. And so again, but there's this connection of the invisible to the to the visible. And and so there has to be this means of transmission. And, and so you spoke, JK, about this idea of it transmitting over time and, and being taught to us, you know, by our ancestors, by our parents, by our teachers, by leaders who we look up to. And I think that's a, a very important example of this kind of metaphysical transmission of information through the universe. Uh, certainly it's a universe where information is conserved. The law of conservation of information is a universal, universal principle. Even Hawking and Leonard Susskind has a very famous debate about that. And they both agreed that information is never destroyed. And so if knowledge is information, it's always present. Uh, it's a question of where is it present? And, and if it's used in the soul, where is the soul? I keep going back to that uh, triangle diagram. Uh, Greg, your thoughts? Okay, as, uh, as uh, we're talking, I'm kind of uh, trying to, the, the, the thoughts come up as to why that, uh, you know, uh, Plato having a uh, Socrates to, Socrates to think that knowledge is a result of a refraction. And I think there's a logical necessity in that line of argument. Uh, because Plato think, you know, the forms are immortal and uh, eternal, it's always there. Therefore, you cannot have, have it becoming, it's being. And it's just like the soul itself. Therefore, there's no way that you can say it's learned because it's learned meaning becoming. So it's a being, it's always there. So I think there's a logical necessity for him to carry this out. And I think uh, this, uh, this notion of recollection is just one way to think that could, could resolve this, uh, this difficulty he has. But if you think that, you know, at that time, uh, you, you think uh, for, for put it forward to the time of Aristotle, Aristotle totally turned the whole thing around. He's saying that, you know, there's no such an uh, eternal thing as, as this. Uh, conceptual being, even though the concept is, 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 is eternal in the sense that it connects to, uh, to the nature in a fundamental way. But uh, he, is, he has a notion that everything we learn is based on our experience, the perception. So everything is learned in this world. Nothing is uh, coming innate. So Aristotle, you know, in that way, he was able to formulate his entirety of, of the thing, how, how we know, basically, I'd come to that. So I think I found very interesting the transition of this and also the beginning of why this question of the question come up. Thank you. And I will return to your words, logical necessity. I, I, I like those and I, I have a particular connection I want to make, but first we'll, we'll have uh, uh, Jane and then JK. Jane? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, so getting back to the question of soul, uh, I think this, this uh, will match up a bit with what JK was saying. Uh, intelligence, from what I understood in the Timaeus, intelligence is part of the same, it's part of the eternal. And our soul is the essence that joins the intelligence to body, which is the other. So that which is um, becoming, that which is changing, that which is finite. Uh, and so basically, as, as I understand it, that through our soul is how we are able to get any sort of good opinion or account of the reason why. But at the same time, for, uh, this is the impression that I got from other dialogues. Our body is actually what can act as a sort of inhibitor to us getting to that knowledge and intelligence, if that makes any sense. And about the invisible and visible, to me in the Timaeus, the invisible is once again, it's the eternal, it's the being. So the invisible is the intelligence and the visible is that which is becoming, it is the body. And our soul is the essence that helps them join together, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, it makes sense. Uh, thank you. The um you know, that this idea of the binding of the eternal state of is that never becomes but always is, and the state of becoming which never is. Again, those distinctions that are made at Timaeus 28a, 
uh, I think certainly there's that binding process that happens. And I think it seems logical and maybe a logical necessity, if I could borrow Greg's words that, uh, uh, or JK's words, I think they were that, uh, um, that, that there'd be some sort of binding factor and it would make sense that the soul be that binding factor. And certainly in terms of, you know, what you said about the, the body kind of being this constraint against us getting to this knowledge, I think that's a theme that we'll see in Phaedrus, I think it is, where the, if, I, if I've got my dialogues right, where, where Plato has the, the, the soul driving two chariots. One is, one, is, one is driven by a wild, untamed horse and that leads in a bad direction, and the other is driven by a good horse. And somehow the soul has to corral these two horses together and make them drive in a consistent way that uh, that leads to to some good outcomes. So uh, interesting points. Thank you very much for those. Uh, JK, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I guess, uh, you know, um, we have a tendency to, you know, I, I'm, uh, to uh, imagine the soul as the kind of, uh, you know, uh, constant uh, consistent unity that doesn't change you know and you know maybe it's um, if there, if there is a soul may, maybe it's not not that uh, that kind of unity that um, returns and lives forever maybe it's the maybe it's just, it's also the difference you know uh, the difference is is more creative than the, than the same there is some sameness there but it's it's not uh, it's it's not uh, consistently the same you know just like the you can't step into the same river twice uh because you're uh, every time you step in it's a, it's a different uh, it's a different river so so maybe what is more consistent is the difference and uh, and that has to be part of maybe maybe the main part of what the soul soul is if there is a soul that um, that eternally returns and, and is repeated because uh, uh, that's how we want to think of the soul as something that uh, that uh, repeats and returns and just like life, how we live life. And as we live life, you know, our lives every is not the same every moment. It's all constantly changing. Mm -hmm. And like someone said, uh, you, if you had, if it was static, you know, your life would be not very interesting, right? So it would be boring. So, but it's also not very realistic you know, to imagine a static uh, life in a static uh, universe. Oh, very, very interesting. I like the I like this idea of difference, and uh, you know, certainly, certainly, I, 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 I'm not seeing in in Plato a concept of the soul as being unchanging. I think it's something that deals with change and something that deals with difference. So, I very much like the word that you. That you used, and it again ties to that concept in in Timaeus of mixing the different with the same. So somehow, if if we're always in that beautiful analogy that you had of stepping in the river, and you're never touching the same molecules of water at the same time, the the stage that we're on is continuously moving, and the soul needs to continuously place itself in the context, which was a word that was used earlier in in our dialogue here. It always has to find the context. And it always has to find the unifying point, maybe that bonding point, like in that triangle, the, the point that, that joins the same and the different. Um, so I think it's very, the soul is tasked, I think, with a lot of things, maybe, and maybe, maybe you've just touched on the key task of the soul is to, is to reconcile those differences and to continue to find the same. Um, thank you for that, Jane. I just I just wanted to say that I, I agree with what was just said about the soul. And in the dialogues, I had the sense that um, Socrates sort of viewed the soul as being both the same and the other. So that that's a little bit, that's probably exactly what was just said. So it is at the same time, has something that is eternal and something that is changing at the same time. And I find that the concept, at least the way that I understood in the, in the dialogue of the soul has this sort of, pre-dialectic concept to it where you have um, one thing then another thing that contradicts and that contradiction helps to join the soul in unity mm -hmm. yes I, and, and you know the, the way you put it I think is is it makes me think of this immense power of the soul you know if the soul is connected to both 
the unchanging eternal world, the world that always is and never becomes, and the world that is always becoming and never is. And that's really the best of both worlds, isn't it? And it's, that's kind of, you know, it doesn't get much better than that. Like, can anyone imagine anything better than that? You know, being connected to both, uh, you know, both the, the, the physical, you know, changing realm and the unchangeable eternal realm. So it's, uh, it's an interesting, it's an interesting thought. And maybe this is the point just as we have about 15 minutes left. Uh, if you wouldn't mind sharing the screen, because I wanted to get to that, um, to the section where uh, Socrates brings Mino's attendant to the forefront. And, you know, this again, we, we've touched on it a number of times throughout our dialogue, this idea of recollection and knowledge being recollection. So here, and I've just, this is in the, um, the Plato Complete Works, you know, associate editor, Doug Hutchinson, who we had on the, uh, the show a number of weeks ago, uh, co uh, was the associate editor of this book. And so this book, the version of Mino in this book has this footnote in it. Um, so this is where Socrates has brought, brought uh, Mino's uh, unschooled assistant. So this school, th this assistant has had no teaching. Remember, the, the opening question of the Mino was, can virtue be taught? And so Socrates, as I said before, makes this, makes this assertion that uh, nothing prevents a man after recalling one thing only uh, from discovering else everything else for himself, right? So I think Socrates is maybe trying to demonstrate this in this scene, uh, and this starts at um, uh, 82b. And so Socrates says um, in this in this little uh, section that I've quoted, he says. So he's saying to Mino, pay attention then whether you think he is recollecting or learning from me. And, and he is referring, referring to the uh, attendant of, of Mino. So Mino says, I will pay attention. So Socrates says, now he's talking to the attendant. He says, tell me now, boy, you know that a square figure is like this. So he, he must have been drawing a square. And the attendant says, I do. And so Socrates says, a square then is a figure in which all of these four sides are equal. So that's one little particular piece of logic about a square uh, that Socrates makes explicit. And we all know that the square has all, all four sides are equal. It's just something that we all know, right? And the attendant says, yes, indeed. And Socrates says, and it also has these lines through the middle equal. And the attendant says, yes. So on the screen here is a is a just a drawing of a square. Um, and it's uh, and it's got uh, lines through the middle. You know they're inter intersecting at ninety degrees in the middle, and so we can see the outer lines of the square are labeled one foot. So there's two one foot lines on the top, two one foot lines on the left, two one foot lines on the bottom, two one foot lines on the right, and in the middle, each of those lines bisecting the middle is each one foot. So there's four lines in the middle. 90 degrees, each one of those lines is one foot. So you see the square has on its exterior uh, two one foot lines on each side and in, in its interior, four one foot lines. Now, the, the challenge in this particular part of the dialogue and, and you know, I think we won't have time to read it together, but you know, the, the challenge is what happens when you start doubling and tripling and quadrupling this? Uh, this image. So at the end, I think Socrates is trying to see how much the see how much the attendant can remember. And again, Socrates says, I will not teach this person anything. I, I I will I will not tell him the answers. I will let him get to it only by asking questions. So in this process of asking questions, um, Socrates is uh, trying to demonstrate that knowledge is recollection. In other words, knowledge is can be discovered on one's own, uh, just building on things that you already know. So knowledge is like a continuous process. And I wanted, and here I wanted to just, you know, go back on, uh, and I'm sorry, I think it was, I think it was JK who said that, that it was a knowledge, that it was a logical necessity uh, for recollection. And I wanted to just pause here and, and just say, um, for some context, you know, or, or ask the question, is logic ever broken? Does, does log, sorry, does knowledge, is knowledge ever broken? Does knowledge ever end? And it goes back to a question I asked earlier. 
is there any uh, boundary or limit to knowledge or to the soul? Um, so if we approach it from the perspective of knowledge has no end, um, then I think maybe that logical necessity that was expressed uh, is in, in terms of recollection is something that, that becomes more obvious. You know, if, if, if knowledge is just continuously out there, you know, then, then our job is to discover it, to discover it by recalling it. It's out there. We need to recall it. And we use, we use logic. We use wisdom. Um, we use virtue to discover that knowledge that's out there. And so, you know, the, the question that uh, Socrates puts to the, the slave or to the attendant is, okay, so I've got a, I've got a square here. It's got two feet on, on either side. What's the area of the square? So the area of a square of side length two, remember each, each side in a square is equal. Socrates has given us that. So the side, so the area is four, two times two is four. And, and so he, he leads the, the attendant to this by just simply asking questions. He doesn't say to the attendant, uh, the area is two times two equals four. He, he asks the attendant first, how long is each line? The attendant says two. And then he says, how many squares are there? And the attendant says four. Um, so there's an example of knowledge that is expressed that has not been taught. All that's been asked, all, all that's happened is that a question has been asked. Now, the question becomes more interesting in, in terms of proportion. So Socrates starts to say, well, what happens if you double it? Are you going to get eight, right? Because, you know, he says, what, what is two times four? And the attendant says, well, it's eight. Well, then Socrates says, Let, let's double, let's double the, the size of the square. So the question is, how do you double the size of the square? Do you just simply put another square next to it? Or do you have to add three more squares, right? Because if you just put one, if, so each, so again, we're looking at a square here, you know, the each side length is two. So if we put another square next to it, we'll have a rectangle that's a total of four feet wide, but only two feet tall, right? So to double this, we actually need to add three more squares. We need to add one square next to this, and then we need to add two more squares either above or below, and then we'll have double the number of squares. But the area is actually quadruple, right? So you have a square with uh, side lengths of four, four horizontal and four vertical, right? And an area four times four is 16. So we started with a, a square uh, of area four, two times two equals four. But to double it, we wind up with an area of 16. So that, that relationship, that proportion, that's not a doubling, right? That, that's actually quadrupling. And so Socrates says, well, okay, isn't that strange? Because I was, I was looking for a square that is as double in area. So I started with a square of area four, and I want a square, square of area eight. Eight would be double the area, right? But to double the number of squares, I actually had to add, add three more squares. And that gave me an area of 16. I didn't want 16. I wanted an area of eight. So the question is, how do you get double the area in the square? So in the interest of time, Eva, if we just flip to the next slide or to the next page, this is Socrates' answer. So except it's not Socrates' answer. He, he, he leads the, the slave to discover this by saying, what, ha what happens if you, if you cut off half of the, uh, half of the volume or, or half of the the length by putting diagonals inside the square. So what we're looking at here on the scene, uh, on the screen, is the same square that we started with. You know, each uh, each side length is now four, but we've got a diamond inside the square. So we've added we've added a uh, we've added some diagonals. So uh, 
now this inside the di inside the diamond inside the square we now have something with an area of eight and so there was an interesting process here that Socrates followed again he didn't teach he didn't give this diagram to the to the slave in fact this is this is in the footnotes to the printed text so this is the editors of the text telling us what Socrates was was leading the the attendant to discover but it was through Socrates questioning and in Socrates says well what happens if you put a diagonal in and you you cut off half the cut off half the space inside the square and then it led to this realization and then Socrates makes the point that well you know the the, the attendant would have said originally, well, you know, to get eight, you have to get somewhere between four and 16. So you'd have to go halfway in between, but halfway in between would lead to something that doesn't work. So, you know, at, at this at this point, the attendant would have quit um, if Socrates had not kept on questioning and, and encouraging him to seek and to learn. And so it's it's in this process that the attendant was give an incentive to continue to seek and to learn and to discover new knowledge. And so it, it was this discovery, how you double the area of a square uh, of area four into a square of area eight, uh, you create this diamond inside the original square. And those who know the Pythagorean theorem will know that those diagonals are the square root of eight. Two squared plus two squared equals eight. Um, so I just wanted to to kind of give that as that demonstration of, of Socrates, you know, kind of leading the the attendant to that knowledge. And, and Eva, if you would just unshare the screen as we we wind up, and, and we might just go a minute or two over on this. But uh, I just wanted to to make sure that that process that Socrates was demonstrating with the with the attendant of Mino, who hadn't had schooling, uh, this was the process that was being used, and the process to demonstrate that that knowledge is recollection. It, it's it's something that somebody can discover on their own, and I think it's a very empowering uh, idea, perhaps. Um, but it, it's it's definitely something that was being demonstrated. And so, I'm just wondering, in the in the few minutes that remain, if if, if anybody has any thoughts on that or on the other themes of of the dialogue that we've discussed, and it's been a great discussion today. Greg, your thoughts? Yeah, you know, it, it is interesting that uh, they uh, they use this uh, form of learning as a recollection, uh, as it's uh, uh, pre-existing uh, pre before. But uh, but as the time goes by, we know that that we can discover new things or learn new things either through self-learning or be taught. Or which is other people told you, and or, or, or learning from the existing tech, uh, knowledge. So, 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 uh, so I, I felt that you know it is interesting that you should just start from from the notion of recollection to to refer the first type of of learning as just a recollect rather than self discovery, which is the innate property of intelligence. You know, our intelligence. Uh, or oh, way of reasoning of intelligence are fundamentally logical. Logical meaning in the sense that you're always trying to match to the reality. And over time, you become very logical because the reality is logical. Therefore, over time, you become logical. Well, thank you. And, and the, the point over time, and unfortunately, we won't have time to get to it today, but you know, the point at the end of the dialogue that uh, you know, where Mino asks, what's the difference between true opinion and knowledge? And Socrates makes the point, well, true opinion is good. It, it, both true opinion and knowledge can be correct. And so why is it better to have knowledge rather than true opinion? Well, he makes the point that knowledge or true opinion needs to be tied down before we can call it knowledge. It needs to be true through time. Uh, it needs to be true not just now, but it needs to be true tomorrow. It needs to be true next year. And that's this idea of tying knowledge down. So having just, just happening to luck into true opinion, uh, you can be right, but you won't be right all the time. And so being right through all time from past to present to future is the key to knowledge. Um, so that's an important point. I just wanted to make sure that people understood. 
we'll have time just for Jose and JK. And then unfortunately, it comes time to wrap up today's episode. So Jose and JK, Jose? Yeah, I, I, I was just going to point out that the, the process of learning, okay, uh, as far as I see is uh, two steps. First of all, is uh, like uh, you have to get to the state of aporia. It means like a, a state that uh, you have to recognize that you don't know anything. And from there, start learning. So you have to get rid of your kind of your false or assumptions. And he he uses that in the with the slave and with Meno as well, you know. Okay, I was just going to point out. Yeah. Well, thank you. And that and that's actually a very important point to remind everybody about. Uh, about Socrates, you know, and, and his famous saying, you know, that he's the smartest man alive, or he knows one thing, which is he knows nothing. And I think if one starts from that that perspective, then everything becomes knowable. But I think if you get stuck in this idea that you already know things or know everything, then you will not continue to seek and to learn, which is the one thing that Socrates in this dialogue says that we always must continue to seek and to learn. There's no end to learning. There's no end to learning and there's no end to the soul that learns. And so I think that's a, to me, that's a message that resonates from this dialogue. JK, take us to the wrap up. Your yeah, thoughts? that's an interesting uh, paradox uh, because you're saying that, uh, you're saying two things at once that uh, we already know, you know, based on this idea of recollected uh, knowledge, right? Re recollection and this kind of um, in, um, coming into this world with all these, uh, all this, uh, you know, uh, collective knowledge, but at the same time, we don't know unle until unless we we, we try uh, uh, go through the process of learning, and the, you know, and and that um, and that this kind of uh, knowledge that uh, he also shows in uh, some of the dialogues that, that uh, you you can also um, recollect some of this knowledge through dreams, as well as through the rational process of. Uh, of uh, the dialectical process of reason, mm -hmm. and there's so many different, you know, uh, ways of uh, learning, creative processes of uh, art and so forth. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting, you know, idea. This um, the paradox of knowledge and <laughs> and learning and and so forth. Yeah, it's been an interesting discussion. Thank, thank you. Absolutely. Well, thank you. And, uh, you know, this, the idea of dreams, you will see a dream in, in, so I mentioned that we'd look at the Carmides next. And so there is a dream in the Carmides. If we recall our discussion on the Fido, there was a very kind of strange dream at the end of the Fido. Um, so I think there's, there, dreams definitely have a place in this. And, uh, and certainly knowledge continuously needs to be tested. We can never be satisfied like Mino was at the beginning of the dialogue, we can never be satisfied that we know something. Mino at the beginning says, I know what virtue is. And then he gives a definition that is destroyed within, within a few paragraphs. Uh, and that's what happens. The more we think we know, the more we become complacent and the less we test our limits. And so I think there's, there's such a good message again, and it is so relevant to the power that we are developing uh, today with our computing technology, um, that uh, that this is something that really needs to be understood and appreciated. And uh, so I can never get enough of Plato's Mino and, and his other dialogues. And I think, you know, in the course of our own dialogue here, I've actually learned so much from what, what people have said, the, you, the words that people have used, the connections that people have made. Uh, you know, so I, I can't thank the participants enough for, uh, for being here and, and partic partic participating in this dialogue. So... Uh, it's been a great time. Thank you all for attending, and I'll pass it over to Eva to uh, to wind us up, and we look forward to meeting again in two weeks. Thank you. This was Plato's Pod. It's always exciting to share, learn, and discuss together, friends. We know this would make Plato F. Lapton proud, too. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, James. See you at another episode. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Yeah, see you next time.